Now, just a heads up, uh, there will be no class next week. Um, it's my, my wife's birthday next week on the 9th. And so uh, there's a congregation council party on her birthday. So I can't let that stand as our birthday date. So we're going out on, on December 8th. Um, so we won't be around. Okay. So no class next week, but we'll pick it up then uh, the week after that. So tonight we are uh, finally getting into Deuteronomy chapter 4. We took a little hiatus and then we had a detour through five things you don't say at a funeral. Um, I hope you found it edifying. I always enjoy talking about that when when we come around to it. Um, And I forgot my funeral plans again. I'll remember that another time. But um, today we're going into chapter 4. And go ahead and just open up to that. Um, And we're going to try and get through, well, all the way to verse 14, uh, which covers a lot uh, because... There's actually kind of two sections within that uh, in, within that reading, and hopefully we can get to both of them. Uh, but take a look at Deuteronomy chapter four, just verse one. And if you look at how it starts, it says "and now," and that "and now" is really it's it's one Hebrew word. It's "veata," and it's an important word. Translate it and now, but it's it signals a really important transition that's happening here in Moses' first sermon. Remember this uh, section here up until about chapter five. It's all constituting one sermon of Moses, and basically what he's been doing so far in this sermon is he's been reviewing a portion of God's history with His people and His saving actions with uh, the people of Israel. He really has, Moses has really downplayed the faithlessness of Israel, and he's really played up uh, the grace and the mercy of of God the Father. And if you remember, that corresponds, as we talked about, to that kind of uh, treaty um, that's made between a king and his people, recounting all the acts of, uh, of the king's mercy and grace and benevolence towards his people, and that kind of sets the stage for the for what is to come. Uh, and what is to come, as you'll see, is this transition now towards away from what God has done in the past to this and now. And what does the, what does the and now call attention to? Now it's time to pay attention to the covenant. Now it's time to hear this exhortation uh, and this appeal to keep God's covenant instruction. And so you're going to see that shift in our um, in our text for today. It's no longer talking about the wilderness wandering. It's going to be talking about the Lord's law and specifically what was given at Mount Horeb. And all this really does set up not just this sermon, but the next sermon, which is going to get into a lot of detail as to what the law is and how how they ought to live as God's people. So you're you're going to hear that in this reading for tonight. There's a shift of focus. Away from what's happened in the past to, and now. Now the present appeal for uh, covenant obedience, all right? And, but even that, this turn now towards the covenant obedience, Moses is going to emphasize over and over again that even this obedience is brought forth by what God first reveals of himself, right, in his, in his word. We're going to hear about the judgments and the, the rulings Right? And so obedience is not, it's not up to us to figure out what obedience looks like. No, God lays out for us what obedience looks like in his, in his law and in his word. And there's this wonderful section. Um, I hope we get to it. Uh, take a look at, um, oh, where is it? ba 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 Oh, it's past verse 9, I know. It says, what nation has a God like us? <laughs> the, what nation has a God who is so seven. near? Seven. Is it verse 7? There it is. For what a great nation is there that has a God so near to us as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? It's kind of this, um, this admission that it's, it's not anything that Israel has on its own or who they are on their own. 
but who they are is solely uh, based upon the, the revelation of God to them. The revelation that God is near, cares for them, and actually lays out um, a way of life for them. So it's, um, it's a wonderful little rhetorical question that highlights where true life, where true obedience is to be found in what God has revealed. Okay? So, uh, one other thing before we jump in. I want to give a little advice. Uh, this was a, one of my Old Testament professors uh, talked about this. When, when you're reading uh, the Old Testament, um, the Hebrew language is a verbally-based language. Um, I mean, we get this in English, too, where even nouns are kind of based on verbs, and you can kind of see a connection between a noun and a verb. But in Hebrew, it's 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 all the more frequent. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And also, in the way that the Hebrew language works, you want to pay attention to the verbs. When you're reading other languages, like when you're reading Greek, you pay attention to maybe the, the prepositions. They kind of help guide you through the, the maze of how Greek works. In English, we like adjectives and we like adverbs, you know, to help really express something. Hebrew, it's all about the verbs. So as you're listening today, listen for the verbs. And they come shining through verbs like listen, do, obey, practice, keep. Right? So listen for the verbs in our, our, uh, our section for tonight. Um, and I think that'll that'll help maybe guide guide your way through it. But let's start with we'll start with just verses one to eight uh, tonight, and then hopefully we'll get to verses nine to fourteen. But let's just start with one to eight. And again, listen for all that that jumps out at you, the the parts that uh, maybe catch your attention or cause you to question what's going on. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them, that you may live, and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as to the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Here ends the reading. Mm -hmm. Like I said, hopefully we'll get to verses 9 to 14 too, but uh, we'll take this chunk first. All right, what jumps out at you in all that? What verbs did you hear? Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Right. Uh, Peter and Betty, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an, in yeah, well, we're going to see as we go into the next sermon of Moses, he, he reiterate, he tells the Ten Commandments again. Yeah, so they're, they're given again. I mean, they're not given in the sense as, uh, like a re-given, it's given in the sense of they're reminded of what they were. Um, and by the way, it's passages like this that give us fits. Um, how many 
how many commandments does he say? Ten, right? And actually, the Hebrew word there is, um, it's not command. It's actually a word, dabar, um, which can mean just word or account or thing. It's kind of like uh, the, the Greek word is logos. You know, that's the, the word we heard in first in John in the first chapter when it says the word became flesh. Logos just means word. Devar means word. Which is kind of the, and here's where it gets into, gets us into trouble. If you go to the Ten Commandments, and we'll get there uh, in a little bit, but it doesn't number them. I like to say here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It just says thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. And if you have any Baptist friends, which I hope you do, um, <laughs> but you'll you'll notice they number the commandments differently. Um, if you have any Jewish friends, you'll notice they number the commandments differently. And it all has to do with Moses said there's 10 of them, so you somehow have to number 10 of them. But there's no indication in the actual text that says this is the 10. Um, so for instance, if you turn to Exodus 20, If you go to Exodus 20, doo -doo 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 -doo, you get the uh, you get the list, right? But it's interesting. Here's how the here's how the Jewish people traditionally numbered them. It says uh, in verse tw in chapter 20, verse one, and God spoke all these words, davarim, saying, "Here's the first word." I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's actually the first word in the Jewish ordering of the commandments. The second word then is, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4 then was taken as commentary to verse 3. In other words, you shall have no other gods before me. Kind of think in good Lutheran terms, what does this mean? Well, it means... You shall not make for yourself a carved image, blah, 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 blah. So then you get to uh, the third commandment would be then, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, fourth commandment being, remember the Sabbath. Fifth commandment would be, you shall not uh, murder, or you honor your father and mother. Sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Eighth commandment, you shall not steal. Uh, Ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. Tenth commandment, you shall not covet. And they just kind of took, you know, all of that coveting together. So that was just the Jewish way of ordering it. Uh, the early church, when they looked at this, they said, well, that first commandment doesn't really apply to us. Um, you know, the, God didn't bring us out of a, the land of Egypt. So what we're going to do is we're going to bump everything. Moses said there's ten, so how many do we have to have? 10. So we're going to bump it down. So we're going to bump it down to the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. And then again, verse 4 is taken as commentary. But then what's the problem? 9 and 10. So what do they do? They split the covets into two commandments. Now, that was the way the church did it for a long, long time. Then at the time of uh, the Reformation, there were all these... Uh, Protestants who came along and said, you Catholics are engaged in idolatry because you have all these statues and you have all of these. And so what did they do? They made four. They made four its own, its yeah. own commandment. And then they shrunk nine and ten back together again. Okay? Um, as Lutherans, we don't, I mean, we have, we use the traditional numbering. Um, It's Moses' fault. He said 10, so we have to have 10. We and don't. You have to assume he said 10 now. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't really lose a whole lot of sleep over it. All that is to say, uh, we've kind of shied away from that Protestant impulse um, because as, as Lutherans, we, we try to conserve. But also, there's a lot of damage done uh, by the iconoclasts in the Reformation who went around smashing statues. Uh, 
smashing out windows, destroying paintings, um, because they saw it all as a, an offense to that, what they would say is the second commandment. Okay, So, and we say those, that art is actually a way that God uses uh, to spread the gospel. So, Islam also is anti-image, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. They do not do any images of people at all in their artwork. Well, especially the, yeah, and especially the prophet, right? There can't be any depictions of, of the prophet. Uh, Judaism, too. I mean, there wouldn't be any depictions of um, of God, you know, any. Uh, and this came up in the early church. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a, an open debate, you know. What about, how do we use, or can we use images as Christians? And there was an intense debate that took place, and kind of the, the argument that won the day, um, not fully and completely, because you still do have Christians who will say any image is idolatry. But um, the, the, uh, the side that won the day said, in the incarnation, we have been given an image of the invisible God in Jesus Christ. Um, and that comes directly from St. Paul, right? that kind of language. And so uh, it, the, the, in the incarnation, you have this uh, kind of a, a God saying once again that creation is good. And so we can use images of saints. We can use images of Christ because we have been given an image in Christ. And so ever since then, and that was the what, fourth century, maybe even third century, um, broadly speaking, that argument has kind of won the day um, in Christendom. So we have art and we have images and we have uh, depictions of Christ. In fact, even in we saw even in the catacombs, right? There's images of Christ as the good shepherd um, from very, very early on. So, all right, that was kind of an aside. Let's let's jump back into um, uh, let's jump back into the verbs. All right, take a look at verse one. Uh, what's the first verb we get there? You have here, okay? Listen, listen. All right. This the the verb here is uh, a Greek or a Hebrew word that, when I say it, you you might recognize it from another place in Scripture. Um, Shema is the Hebrew word for hear or listen. Does that ring any bells? Shema. Deuteronomy six. Turn to Deuteronomy six really quick. This is uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. If you want to think of, uh, you know, if, if, there, if the uh, ancient Israelites had a creed, this would be it. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Shema. Um, it says, Hear, O Israel. See why it's called the Shema? Because at the beginning it says, Hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If you've ever been to like an, an Orthodox Jewish house, you might notice on their the doorpost of their door they have something called a mezuzah. It's a little looks like a little box that's just kind of nailed to the uh, the doorpost. Um, if you open that box, inside would be like a little scroll, and usually it has like the Shema written in the scroll because uh, it is kind of like the creed of, uh, of of the Jewish people, and so. Or if you've heard of phylacteries from the Old Testament, you know, where people bind boxes to their heads or to their hands, you know, the Lord says, you know, bind this to your to your to yourself. Like they took that literally to say, all right, we're gonna we bind these phylacteries, these little boxes, and inside the box, oftentimes would be the Shema, would be the, the writing of the Shema, because it was that uh, significance significant as a expression of the of the Jewish faith. But here, the Shema, it's not just listen. It's not just hearing. Whenever the, whenever the object of hearing, whenever the object of Shema is the word of God, it carries with it not just hearing, but obeying and doing. In Greek, we actually get, the, uh, get something very similar, that the Greek word for obey comes from the word to hear. 
So to hear is to obey. Uh, you know, you think of talking with your kids, and you say, you know, are you listening? You know, I heard what you said. Yeah, I know you heard what I said, but are you listening? And what do we mean by that? Are you, are you paying attention, right? And are you taking those words to heart and keeping them? That's the same sense here with the, the Hebrew. So listen, that is hear, that is obey, right? Uh, what God has for this. I mean, another kind of, Another kind of New Testament connection is in James uh, chapter 1, verse 22. James exhorts uh, Christians not just to be hearers of the words, but doers, right? And that's kind of the sense, right? You hear and you do. You take them to heart, okay? So the first thing is to hear, to listen, to obey. And what are they supposed to listen and obey? What do your translations say there? Okay, you got decrees. Anybody have something different? Decrees, statutes and rules. Statutes and rules. Anybody have anything else? Commandments. Commandments. Okay. Um. There are two Hebrew words here. One is hachma, uh, or hachim, which is the first word, which gets translated statutes. Um, the other one is mishpat. And mishpat is what we translate here as rules. Um, some people see kind of a um, kind of a law gospel thing going on here. That the hakma, the the statutes, are those things that you're supposed to do. Uh, the mishpat are more like rulings that the court gives. So in other words, kind of uh, you know it, this is the sentence that's given. And if you think about it here, it's, it's a, a gracious sentence, right? Because the Lord's giving them the land. Um, I think that might be taking it a little too far. I think kind of what Moses is doing with these words is just saying, hey, the hachma and the, and the mishpatim, it's everything. It's everything that the Lord uh, has commanded you and given you. Everything that I'm going to be teaching, you need to pay attention to. And he's going to emphasize that here in the next part. All right. Um, and, to, and to make sure that you understand the urgency of it, what does he say in the rest of verse 1? He's giving you, uh, or the Lord has given you uh, these words so that you may live. The, the goal of God's word is to give life. That's what, that's what God is desirous of. And I think it's rather significant that that's the first thing in the list. Yes, go in and take possession of the land. But first off, God's word is life. You can think of, you know, remember what Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly, right? That's the goal, the purpose of God's revelation here. And that's the urgency of keeping it. Because if you don't keep it, right, if you veer from it, what's the other way? Yeah. And this is a very common way of talking in the Old Testament uh, and New Testament too. But the two ways are life and death, the wise and the foolish. As moderns, we like the middle ground. No. There's life and there's death. So uh, don't, don't add or subtract to God's word. Hear it, keep it, observe it, because the purpose of it is to give life. Right? And uh, to impress upon this, we get to verse 2. So if you want to know what it means to hear um, and to keep, we kind of get a negative description of what it means to hear and, and keep. So in verse 2, what it means is, you do not add to the word that I command nor do you take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. What about all the rules and regulations that were later added on by the time of Christ? Were those, I mean, they were to help them, save them in the life to reach the afterlife in heaven. Yeah. So, 
And, and that's also good for us not to have the tax burden. Yeah. Well, this is the problem that Jesus ran into in his ministry, if you remember. Uh, you know, uh, there's a famous example of something called Corbin, uh, where they were adding kind of regulations about giving, and it was being used as a way to not provide for your parents. And Jesus came along and said, woe to you, right? You're using the traditions of men to add to the word of God. And it's interesting, as I was kind of thinking about this, you know, you have these dual problems of adding to the law or taking away from it. And generally speaking, this doesn't work, I'm painting with very broad brushes here, but generally speaking, kind of outside of the church, we have the problem of subtracting from the law. Inside of the church, what's our problem? Adding to the law. Because if you go through, uh, if you go through the Old Testament, you find a lot of injunctions against adding anything. And kind of time and time again, when you add something, you know what you end up becoming? Well, a kind of heresy, but you end up becoming a legalist, right? Because the, the idea of adding something to the law is not only have I done this, I've done even more, right? And that puffs up pride. I mean, that's exactly what you saw with the Pharisees in Jesus' own day. Right? So kind of maybe the warning for us in the church is make sure – Make sure we keep a clear division between um, traditions and opinions on the one hand and the Word of God on the other. Traditions and opinions are fine, and they can be godly, and they can be used in, in good ways. But we shouldn't go about necessarily teaching people that that is what the Word of God is, and you have to do it. So, for instance, we have the season of Advent. Tradition, right? Is it good tradition? Yep, you don't gain something, and we don't burden people's conscience by saying you have to do it, right? If you don't want to observe it, that's fine, right? That's it's not in the Word of God that way. We in the Lutheran Church have found it as a very good teaching tool help prepare hearts and minds for Christ. And we talk about his coming in Christmas. We, we talk about his coming through the word and sacrament. We talk about his coming, the second coming. Those are all very good biblical things, right? But we wouldn't turn around, put a burden and say, you have to do this and your salvation is, is dependent on this. Right? So as Lutherans, we always, we always want to try and maintain that really clearly. Right? Traditions are over here and they can be very good and godly. But we want to speak clearly where the Word of God speaks, and we kind of want to shut up when the Word of God doesn't necessarily command something, right? Uh, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing, but, nothing the but the truth. There you go. Yeah. So that's that's kind of an interesting thing. You know, outside of the church, I think we have a lot of people who might want to take away parts that they don't like, and we do that too, right? I mean, there are parts we'd like to ignore, but it's interesting that the prong, the problem within the body of Christ or within the people of God has often been to add. Uh, and it's a problem that even Jesus runs into. Jared, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Oh, I, and I think any time, <laughs> um, well, I mean, we see it in specific issues in the church, uh, you know, in, in, you know, one that's just very prominent today is affirmation. For instance, you have churches that will marry same-sex couples. That's pretty clear. I mean, the, the, the universal testimony of Scripture points in a certain way, right? I mean, that would be one glaringly obvious one. Another one is maybe one we've talked about before. If somebody just says, I'm not going to forgive that person. That would also be another example of someone saying, I'm going to take away this part I don't like. Or... Um, yeah, when I see a brother in Christ in need and I just refuse to help. And that's taking away, too. Right? Um, but you have to be careful with the, you start making a list of things, then the list becomes more important than the actual original list. We, we got a pretty good list. Right? The Ten Commandments. Right, and, and that's the. I mean, that's as, as we're going to come back to. This isn't. Whenever we get into a point where we want to start to question, and we we, we try to self justify all the time. Right, when it comes to the issue of forgiveness, well, they need to come and repent. Right, not really. You you can still forgive, right? Or, I mean, to go to another issue, you know, thou shalt not kill. What does that mean? Well, it means you don't, or, or as we read the translation, thou shalt not murder, right? What does that mean? You should not end an innocent life. Well, what is a life? You see how we do it? You see how we start to set things aside because we can define it a certain way? Return to the Word of God. What does it say? Right? Mm -hmm. And somewhere we studied the um, guidelines that are used by people who are attempting to translate the Bible. And, you know, it was like, well, first of all, God wasn't, you know, it isn't a secret, secret code that you've got to, you know, God pretty much laid out the Bible to be clear and obvious mm -hmm. and straightforward and let Bible interpret Bible and mm -hmm. and so on. It, but I was fascinated by you know the guidelines that people were trying to translate the Word of God because there's a huge there's a huge risk of adding or taking away as soon as you look at original text and try to make it intelligible in English or mm -hmm. any other language. And this is why we you know we are not as Lutherans we are not the, those folks who say tradition has no role to play. This is where we can say tradition actually comes in and is, is gives us um, some very good instruction about how to read the Word of God. It doesn't mean we just kind of un, in, in a blind way take that, but tradition can definitely help that um, and give us some kind of interpretive boundaries to look at. Right. Um, so if all of a sudden I come in here and I start saying, well, here's my translation, the Pastor Eggle translation, Right, and here's my interpretation and my commentary on this, and it's found nowhere else in the church ever. You know what you should do? Discard your call. <laughs> what do you mean I discard my call? <laughs> That's pretty drastic. <laughs> right? Yeah, you should be skeptical. Right? Um, and 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 you should search the scriptures and help me search the scriptures to make sure what what I am teaching is actually in accord with. The whole of Scripture, you know, not just me taking out a little bit and piece that I like. Right. I heard a beep, so somebody had a question over here. Was there somebody online who had a thought or a question? Oh. <laughs> oh. So let me, uh, our additions and deletions are <laughs> unten commandments. Yeah, uncommandments. But, but the irony is when we add, and even, you know, if you think about it, even when we subtract, we end up becoming legalist. 
Yeah. You know, because oftentimes when we want to subtract something, it's usually because we want to highlight. We have our own little picadillo that we would really want to push, right? So in humility, we got to submit ourselves to all of it and try to understand it. You know, think about that. That even that word, understand, we don't stand under Scripture. We don't stand over it to say, this is the bit I like, this is the bit I don't. But we want to seek to understand it and to, to be under it. Jerry, yes. Mm. Yeah, well, and again, you, you find that pretty, that similar injunction, right? Um, I don't know if you can necessarily I mean, take the, the passage from Revelation to apply to everything, um, because he was referring to that vision. Um, now, by we could go a long way off, and by extension, I think it might apply. But what John has in mind is specifically that that vision. Yeah. But you do you do have that admonition over. I mean, uh, I think it's Proverbs. Take a look at Proverbs thirty sixteen. Hope I got the right one. It's in that neck of the woods. Thirty sixteen. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, verse 5. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Right? And you see this over and over again uh, throughout the Old Testament. All right, well, all right, so let me let me answer this question here. And I need you to see the board, people at home, because I'm going to draw. Um, so the question is then, you know, are these injunctions specific to maybe say the Mosaic Covenant? Uh, and John is, is specific to the Revelation. I'd say yes. So, you know, when, when we have here in Deuteronomy, um, four, you know, this admonition, or Proverbs 30, or Jeremiah, or, you know, there's, there's a lot of them, right? And we have these specific admonitions. So this is dealing with the Mosaic Covenant. This is dealing with John's Revelation. Um, you know, this is dealing, if we're talking about Proverbs, we're probably talking about a much fuller expression, you know, of of the Old Testament, right? When we get all these admonitions of not adding, I think we have to take them as initially applying to that. However, what we see in the, in the early church is this recognition that it's all the word of God. So if it applies to one part, then it also applies to the whole, but it, not in a direct, necessarily just a, a direct way. It's kind of by association, right? right. That's, that's a good way to put it. It's establishing a principle that we then apply to all of Scripture. So this is talking about the Mosaic Covenant. This is talking about the Old Testament generally. This is talking about John's Revelation. But as we see it all being the Word of God, that principle then guides what, what we apply to everything. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. 
Yes. Yeah. And that's the thing when you add, when you add or subtract, right? What you're trying to do is, uh, you know, pick out what you like and highlight that, right? And it's all a, a form of self-justification. But that comment about, about Christ's own words, that he has not come to abolish, but to fulfill, to bring it to completion. Yep. Yep. Good. Yes. I heard some murmuring. I was asking you... Doug if, if I wanted to ask a question and we could go deeper. Or just... <laughs> <laughs> are, are we good? I didn't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just said it was deep. Yeah, it was fairly deep. All right. So if we're not to add to the law, how did the Catholic Church end up adding tradition as equal to scripture? Okay. So Sorry. See, this is this is bad. I time me. I think I can do this in a minute. So yeah, wait, okay. I'm not started yet. Oh. <laughs> okay. So uh uh what you have basically is, I mean, we sometimes mischaracter, uh, mis mischaracterize the Catholic position as if to say, um, you know, they have no place for Scripture, uh, and they just kind of throw it at the cast it aside. What they recognize is there's something called tradition, and they may describe it as um, the great tradition. They may describe it as the holy tradition. That's usually some of the terms that they use. And what they mean by that is this is an umbrella term which covers maybe this, let me get the pictures, which covers scripture and the living voice of the church. So when they talk about tradition, you have to be real careful when you talk with a Catholic because when we say tradition, what do we mean? We mean this. When they say tradition, they usually mean this, which covers both. Okay, so they they'll they talk about scripture as a form of tradition. It's just the written form. There's also this living voice of the church that composes the other part of tradition. Now the problem comes in when um, you end up elevating this over this, right. which is practically speaking what happens. Right. Um, and that happens because, in large part, people were rather ignorant of what the, the Word of God said. It also happened for other social historical reasons in different instances, right? Um, but when, when they talk about tradition, they mean both of these. This is the living voice. This is the written Word. Okay, and so they would say, and they would point to the parts of the written Word that talk about, you know. Um, well, I'll take, you know, the book of John it says there were so many other things that were done that were not written. But these things are written that, that you may believe. And I'll say, yeah, don't you think Paul, don't you think John, don't you think Matthew, don't you think they had other things to say than what they wrote down? And don't you think that they taught that to their disciples who taught it to their disciples? So there is this kind of living uh living voice that didn't necessarily get codified in the written word. Paul talks about, you know, things, traditions handed down, like in 1 Corinthians. Now, they would say then, because those tra traditions came down through apost that apostolic preaching, that does put it on equal footing with the written word. And that's where we would say, hmm, this, is, this is preserved for a reason, because this is the revealed part of the word. This uh, is malleable. It gets shaped by culture and time. It can be helpful, but it's not it over can scripture. Be destructive too, though. Right? Can like, like it's only indulgence. Yep. yep. When you're trying to be a lot of So this, this is how we as Lutherans talk about this. So in, in the Catholic Church, they often call this living voice a magisterium. Right, so they 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 have a you know a school of bishops and archbishops. They have the teaching office of the pope. All of this constitutes the magisterium. The magisterium is then tasked with making clear what the church's teaching is. Now, 
problem with that is, as Sleeper demonstrates and other reforming threats demonstrate, there were times when the magisterium got it wrong. Or the magisterium flat out contradicted scripture. Okay. As Lutherans, and this is probably on purpose, we don't call a tradition or uh, any of this magisterial, we call it ministerial. Can you see the difference? Uh, what does a minister do? Serves. Serves. Magisterium, that's kind of where we get the word master, right? It's the master. We talk about tradition and reason and experience and the living voice of the church as ministerial. It, it helps, it serves the word of God. It's not over it, but it serves it. Right? I would just clarify that in their belief, when the Pope decrees something, yep. that is like the word of God also. That's the to them. Not but not really. Uh, See, this is another, I mean, this gets in, into the weeds. And we got to be real clear because we don't want to slander our Catholic no, brothers and sisters. I mean, slander, I don't mean in a malicious way. But the, the Pope only speaks infallibly, infallibly when he speaks ex cathedra. And he has to be very clear that he's speaking ex cathedra. It's only happened once. Um, uh, it was with, you know. No, but what is ex? Cathedra. Ex-cathedra. So ex-cathedra, you kind of see the word what? Cathedral. Cathedral. You know what a cathedral is? What that word cathedra means? Seat, right? So a cathedral is the seat of a bishop, okay? So Peter, I'm sorry, the Pope sits in the seat of Peter, okay? So when he speaks ex cathedra, he's speaking from the seat of Peter. Right? And he has to be very clear that he's speaking ex cathedra. I think the only time it's happened is with the Assumption of Mary. I think. Mm -hmm. I'll need to double check that. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But he's only done that. The Pope has only done that once. They have something... Um, Again, the magisterium, where the, the, the council of the archbishops and cardinals meet, um, and they'll offer encyclicals, they'll offer letters and teachings to the church on various issues, but it doesn't mean necessarily that it's on par with the word of God. Right? So again, it's, it's, it's complicated. It, it, it's not as simple as sometimes <coughs> we've made it out to be. But what Luther saw, uh, and what he rightly saw, and if you read the Book of Concord, you get examples of this. There were times where the magisterium just got it wrong. So things like communion only in one kind, right? That was something that developed later in the church and then was instituted as a rule, where you didn't have the body and the blood, you only had the body, or the celibacy of the priests where you go through some of these things that were being imposed by the magisterium without any scriptural warrant. Right? And so that was Luther's and the reformers' complaint. In answer to the question on ex cathedra, for instance, in 2,000 years of church history, an ex cathedra statement has only been pronounced twice. Twice, okay. When Pope Pius the IX defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception on December 8, 1854, and Pope Pius XII defined the dogma of Assumption of Mary on November 1st, 1914. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's happened very rarely, which is which makes it kind of interesting because if you pay attention to your Catholic friends and how they talk about the Pope, it can kind of oh that's a shock. Like you'd think you're Catholic, you love this guy, right? And you kind of have to. Well, it it, it all depends. I know a lot of people who love Benedict the Sixteenth, and I liked Benedict the Sixteenth too, but but who look at this current pope and are just shaking their heads, you know. And the problem, and, and the media doesn't get this either, you know. Uh, you have Saint Francis who says stuff off the cuff on, a, in, on an airplane, and the media comes out and says, "Hey, the Pope said this, so now all you Catholics have to believe this, right?" No, it's not how it works, you know. And you have all these 
more conservative Catholics who are just, you know, shaking their heads. Um, but that's kind of a long answer then, not a minute. But, you know, how did it get to where the Catholic Church uh, kind of supplanted that? Well, they had kind of from the, well, I'd say probably along the later developments, this understanding of a living magisterium that kept this apostolic witness apart from Scripture, which then, in some cases, served as uh, served as an interpretive lens that went over Scripture. And no one was willing to confront it. Yeah. Yeah. Or they were, they just got burned. Or they didn't, they didn't have somebody like Frederick the Wise who kept the authorities from burning them. <laughs> so we got through like two verses tonight. Um, yeah, uh, I don't want to, I don't, I don't wanna, I've got too much on this other stuff. There's some wonderful things here that I don't want to just skip over. So we'll pick up in a couple weeks on verse three. Um, well, we might get to 14. We'll go from three to 14. If you and Carolyn made a bet, I'd help pay for your... <laughs> Jerry, go ahead. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Not to really draw it, but to talk about it took a lot longer. Your watch stopped. <laughs> yeah, that stopwatch going. I quit around five minutes. And I took me a good 45 minutes to figure out how to do the stop. 45 seconds to figure out how to do the stop. But it is a, it's a helpful discussion because as Lutherans, we have a particular way of looking at tradition that I think is a very good way. And I think it's a very biblical way, actually, that we honor and respect tradition. And we just want to keep it in its place. And we don't want to bind people's conscience by what we see as tradition or opinion. We want to bind people's conscience by the word of God. And where the word of God speaks, we want to speak. Where it fails to command, we don't want to command. Now, we want to use tradition as it helps proclaim Christ, and we'll do that. I mean, you see our worship, right? There's a lot of tradition there. And it's all to proclaim Christ. I wouldn't go to a Presbyterian church and say, well, because you're not using divine service number one or two or three or four or five, then you know your worship is false. No, Scripture doesn't say that. We believe that uh, it gives a good confession of what we believe and a good confession of Christ. That's why we use it. But we don't turn around and make it binding on someone else. Right? This is probably a question for next week, but I'm, I'm curious about Things that are labeled a matter of conscience. Mm -hmm. That sounds to me dangerous in that a matter of conscience is up to the individual to interpret. Possibly. And that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and conscience plays a really important role in the life of a Christian. There's a, um, it's in the Catholic Catechism. I love this phrase. The Catholic Catechism calls the conscience the aboriginal vicar of Christ. And what's meant by that is that's it's kind of where the the individual at, at their at their depths encounters the voice of God. Luther himself appealed to conscience, right? In the, the Diet of Worms, what does he say? I can't in good conscience recant, right? Unless you show me based on the word of God. Here I stand. I can do no other. He appeals to his conscience. The, unfortunately, the kind of modern interpretation of conscience is what I like and what I don't like. And what Luther and every medieval person would have understood is you have a responsibility to have a rightly formed conscience. And you can have a rightly formed conscience and you can have a, a disordered conscience. And so that's why the Word of God then has to serve as the as as the guide, as the measure 
what we measure, what we seek to follow. Because it, it even gets to our passage for today, right? Um, <laughs> take a look at uh, Deuteronomy 4 again. You're not going to get out of here that easily. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's going to make his way two weeks. Yeah, yeah. He's got to be some right? But even in this in this next section, take care, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart. Right. And as you go on too, it's going to talk about how all the you know the other peoples are going to look at you and marvel. And what do they marvel about? They don't marvel that you're so smart. They marvel because God has revealed to you and given you a wisdom. Right. So conscience is just not me feeling icky about something or guilty about something or, you know, approving of something. Conscience needs to be rightly formed by the word of God. Um, and, it, and it needs to take seriously, not add or subtract from uh, uh, the commands and the, and the rules, right? Like, and, and Luther had a, a somewhat... He had a strong place for conscience, but he also said it's helpful in the negative. It's usually not helpful in the positive, but it is helpful in saying I shouldn't do that. It's probably not always the best in saying this is what I should do, but it is oftentimes spot on when it says not so much. you ought not do that. Right? And, and he saw that it's kind of the how sin uh, can even distort us even to our depths. But he said, generally speaking, Conscience is pretty good when it's telling you not to do something. It has to be rightly formed by the Word of God. Does that make sense? Okay, well, verse 3 next week. Two weeks, in two weeks. Two weeks, no, no class next week. Um, I'm going to take my wife out. Any suggestions? New would be good. What about the Purdue, the Bistro at Purdue? Not, not Bowen Bistro, but Purdue has like 801 and 501. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Sounds good? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I have. That's a good place. All right. Let's close with our prayer for tonight. Sorry, we kind of went far afield, but that's all right. Uh, Keeping your prayers, please. Um, Cooper Ripke, that is Chris and Jerry's grandson. Uh, he went in the hospital with RSV symptoms. Uh, well, that, um, geez, I uh, heard back there was just an upper uh, respiratory. Oh, good. Not RSV, not in the hospital. Okay. He's home? <laughs> but but and, also... And keep, Jerry tested negative for COVID. Yeah. And keep Jerry in your prayers, too, because his wing got shut down for COVID lockdown, so he's Actually, it was his uh, roommate. Yeah, his roommate tested positive. So keep Jerry in your prayers, too. All right, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. All right. Do you guys next week? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Jerry, are you still there? Oh, he did. Okay. Hey, Homer. Well, thank you.
Good. Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks, Homer. Hey, I'll give you a call on the way home. Love you. Bye. All right, there we go. So let's begin uh, with our evening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. Joyous light of glory, of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with your voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of light, the universe proclaims your glory. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless. And without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your holy word that by due diligence and right discernment, we may establish ourselves and others in your holy faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's get to it. Um, quick technical word for those who are online. Uh, I mentioned to a couple of folks before class started, uh, someone borrowed the microphone that I normally use and I haven't gotten it back yet. So you may have to turn up your volume. Um, I'm just using the computer's mic, so it may not pick it up as well. So I uh, hope that'll, that'll help. It's not you. If you're all of a sudden straining, it's, it's no mic. So, so to go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And uh, as we, boy, it's been a long time. Uh, been since before Thanksgiving, I think, hasn't it? Did we meet in December? We did, okay. All right. So, a little over a month then. Um, but uh, if you remember, just to kind of refresh a lot of this in your head, you know, Deuteronomy is this, uh, the historical instance of this is the, the Israelites getting ready to enter into the promised land. And this is Moses then addressing the people. And in the, the book of Deuteronomy, he's really addressing the people in three sermons. So the first sermon is basically chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. And so we're coming to the end of the first sermon. The second sermon, which is the longest one, and it goes from basically chapter 5 well into you know, probably chapter 26 or 27, and, and that, that sermon, you'll see, really lays out a lot of the, uh, what we would call the law, right? The, the retelling of the Ten Commandments, the retelling of the civil law, the retelling of the, uh, the Levitical law. And then at the very end, you get the, uh, uh, the last sermon, which is a lot of Moses' last words to his people before he died. So uh, the theme of, overall theme of what we've been talking about with Deuteronomy is this call to live in the covenant that the Lord has established with his people, right? And what the, this first sermon has been doing has been laying out God's provision for, for his people. So if you remember, he's, Moses has been recounting the Exodus, recounting the wilderness wanderings with a special emphasis on God's provision for his people, right? Sometimes highlighting the faithlessness of the people, but more often than not, highlighting the faithfulness of God. And basically, he's setting them up. Uh, he's basically saying, hey, this is what God has done for you. Now your response is that of obedience to the one who has redeemed you. Right? Uh, and especially in this uh, chapter 4, I can't help but kind of picture a father or a parent sending their kid off to college, right? There's kind of this, you know, you're not going to go with them, <laughs> and they're going to be faced with a lot of difficult choices, and you're not going to be there to necessarily say, don't do that, don't do this, right? Uh, but kind of just saying, hey, remember how we brought you up, right? Don't do anything stupid, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. But you kind of hear that tone 
and, and there's an urgency in Moses' greeting, which especially in, in, in our reading for tonight. And so uh, the section we're looking at for so Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 14, is really kind of two sections. Uh, the first section goes from roughly verses 1 to, to 8, and then the next section goes from 9 to 14. Um, and so the first section really deals with this exhortation to, to keep the covenant law. The second section, uh, we'll see, he's going to go into kind of to, to poke at their memory, saying, hey, remember back when God gave you this law, all right? So let's go ahead and we'll read through verses 1 to 8, and then we'll come back through. Uh, and as always, when, you're, when we read scripture, listen for those words, listen for those phrases or those images that just kind of jump out at you, whether it's to, uh, because it challenges you or because it might comfort you, or you just hear it and you go, I don't know what that means. You know, uh, what are those words that, that prompt uh, uh, interest in your mind? But let's start with Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them, that you may live, and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal Peor. But you who held fast to the word to the Lord your God are still alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? All right. Now, if you remember, I think we got through at least verses 1 and 2 last time. And, and and you hear again that that exhortation. You, as, whenever you're listening to Hebrew prose, listen for the verbs, right? You can ignore the adjectives and the nouns. Pay attention to the verbs. Mm -hmm. Listen and do and keep and command, right? You, you hear that over and over and over again. And especially as we talked about, I think we spent a lot of time on this last time, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it. And if you remember, we talked about last time, that's one of the problems that Jesus encountered in his ministry. It was not just the taking away bit, uh, but the adding to it. Uh, because when we add to it, uh, we tend to do that as an exercise of self-justification to make ourselves better, right? Look better. Um, but he says, nope, you don't add, you don't subtract. Just keep, uh, keep what, I, uh, what I have given you. Now, that's kind of where we went last time. Uh, if you take a look at verses 3 and 4 then, what, uh, what Moses then does is sets up a nice compare and contrast. Right? So he's, what he does here is he compares and contrasts the, uh, the worshiping of Baal, and we'll get to that in a second as an example of judgment on disobedience, and then he'll contrast that with a life of obedience uh, to the Torah, right? And the biblical writers do this oftentimes, paint these very stark contrasts to get the point. Um, so one of the prep questions I had for you was, um, who can give me a little summary of what happened at Baal Peor? Sihon? Yeah. He wiped, out, he wiped out 24,000 people of the plague because they were worshiping the Lord. All right. Well, you, boy, you, you gave the uh, G version there. 
take a, take a look at, at Numbers chapter 25. Uh, do you guys remember the, uh, the story from Numbers about uh, uh, Balaam and Balaam's donkey, Balaam's ass, right? There's all kinds of jokes there, but we, we don't have time for that. Uh, but you know, the, the, the donkey blocked his way, right, and then spoke to, to Balaam. And so Balaam was a prophet who was supposed to go and, um, and speak judgment on the people of Israel, but he was prevented from doing so, and so he went back. Uh, to Amalek and, and and basically said, "Hey, I can't, I can't curse them." Right? Um, but so right after that episode, take a look at, at Numbers twenty-five. Uh, while Israel was in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Right, so they weren't just worshiping other idols. This was, a, you know, as it was very common in the ancient world, especially in the Near East. You know, a lot of times, God was associated with fertility rites, which was usually connected with some kind of sexual activity. So you'd have, you know, temple prostitutes that you would you would visit. So you got kind of two things going on here. You have idolatry, but you also have this sexual immorality. So while in Israel, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. So again, this wasn't just... Kind of a this was a golden calf kind of incident, but that sexual immorality that is actually quite quite important. Um, and behold, one of the men, a people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of, of Moses and the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. Uh, while, while Phineas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced them both, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the, pe on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Okay. So when you're thinking about the history of the people of Israel, what do you think this evokes in them? Fear, right? Good. about a sense of shame and guilt, right? And, and recognition that that was right, that was the, the, judge, the just judgment of God for having pursued you know, other, other idols. Right? Um, and here's a little side note about that, um, that incident. We find out later that it was actually Balaam who incited the people to it. So while he didn't give a prophecy, he actually Um, so uh, again, we get the contrast here of this apostasy and the faithlessness uh, 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 to God. And then, but then in verse four, you get, "But you who held fast to the Lord are all alive to this day." And there's a word there. I want you to just you can underline it or just kind of mark, mark it in your notes. Uh, but in English, we sell, say, "You who held." <coughs> Fast. Um, the Greek or the Hebrew word is uh, That's usually pronounced as a uh, And what's interesting is this word is um, we find it in Genesis chapter two. It says, "A man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife." Right. So it's a word that has this kind of marital connotation, right? Uh, and so there's a contrast, not just between the faith, faithfulness of, of living in God's way and the unfaithfulness of the people. There's also this kind of marital image, right? Because what was the, 
what was part of the the sin of all Taylor not just idolatry but sexual immorality adultery right and you see this again and again throughout the Old Testament right that uh, the people of God are the bride of Yahweh they're married to Yahweh and so a lot of times idolatry is just kind of synonymous with adultery remember the the prophet uh, uh, Hosea And uh, do you remember the, what the Lord told Hosea to do? Marry a prostitute. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the prophet, Old Testament prophets, you know, they, they loved object lessons. You know, you'd have prophets that would shave their beard and burn it, or they would, you know, lie in their side for 30 days and turn over. All these kind of weird things. But uh, Hosea was actually instructed by God to marry Gomer, who was a prostitute. The idea was this is how, uh, this is an illustration of the, the Lord and his people. And so Hosea tries to be faithful to Gomer, and repeatedly, you know, she's unfaithful. And Hosea continues to kind of welcome her back. And it's kind of the, this whole drama that's played out. And they have kids. Remember their kid's name? Well, I, the, I always remember one. It's Loami. Because there's a little town outside Springfield called Loami. It's actually Hebrew, Loami. But it's in central Illinois speak. It's Loami. And when I first moved there, I thought, that's a strange thing to name a town. Because you know what that name means? Not my people. <laughs> So I don't know, somebody when they named the town just thought, I want to pick a biblical name, and they just picked that one. I think we want to name the town. Anyway. <laughs> yes. But, but again, kind of what you're getting, uh, what you're setting up here is uh, the contrast between uh, the faithlessness of the people uh, and the, that kind of old-fashioned word of whoring after other gods versus clinging to Yahweh. Again, this is the same image that St. Paul is going to use. You know, in Ephesians chapter 5, when he talks about marriage as a, a picture of uh, the, the bride of the church, right? You cling. You cling to uh, your, your bridegroom. And we're going to, at the end of this reading, we actually get some advice as to what that clinging looks like, okay? Um, any questions about those two verses before we continue? All right, then let's continue here uh, with uh, verses 5 to 8. Because the Lord has just said, cling to me, right? Hold fast to me. Well, what does that mean? You kind of get the answer in verses 5 to 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules that the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you're entering. And again, look at the verbs. Keep them. Do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding uh, when you hear all of these statutes. So there's kind of a wonderful gospel thread here. You know, how do you cling to the Lord? Receive his word, right? Hear it and do it. It's nothing that, in a sense, that you can do, <laughs> but it's what his word creates in you what his word does in you and the response uh, that it creates in you. Um, and I just kind of love that the emphasis there in these passages is such a gospel emphasis. Right? It's, it's nothing that you have of your own. It's what I have and what I give you that will be your wisdom and your understanding. And it will be so great that other peoples will see it and say, Jerry, go ahead.
Yeah. Yeah. And it, kind of a, along those lines, I want to share with you guys this article I came across. This is an old one. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, you hear those words that other nations will see the Israelites and kind of marvel. You know, how wise is this? How righteous is this people? Um, that happens to us today as Christians. Uh, this is an article um, written by a fellow named Matthew Paris. This was written back in, in 2008. Uh, it was in the Times, the London Times, I believe. And Matthew Paris, uh, there's no reason you would know him, but he, he's a journalist in, in England, uh, but a very outspoken atheist. And he wrote an article here about a, a trip that he had to Africa. And it just struck me as a great illustration of exactly what uh, Moses is talking about here when, when the world sees uh, people living by the Lord's will, right, and by his word. It's a witness that we can't see anywhere else. So here's what I mean. It says, before Christmas, uh, I returned, this is Matthew writing, I returned after 45 years to the country that I knew uh, as a boy in and it was, a, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Nazalan. Uh, today it's a Malawi. Uh, and in the, the London Times Christmas Appeal, it was a, a special kind of um, drive they had, it includes a small British charity working there. Pump Aid helps rural, rural communities to install a single pump, letting people keep their village wells sealed and clean. And I went to see this work. It inspired me, renewing my flagging faith in development charities. But traveling in Malawi refreshed another belief, too, one that I've been trying to banish all my life. But as an observation, I'm unable to avoid it since my African childhood. It confounds my ideological beliefs, stubbornly refuses to fit into my worldview, and has embarrassed my growing belief that there is no God. As now a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa, sharply distinct from the work of secular charities or government projects or international aid efforts. These alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation, and the rebirth is real. The change is good. I used to avoid this truth by applauding, as you can, the practical work of mission churches in Africa. It's a pity, I would say, that salvation has to be part of the package. If Christians black and white working in Africa do heal the sick, do teach people to read and write, and only the severest, severest kind of secularist could see a mission hospital or a school and say the world would be better without it. I would allow that if faith was needed to motivate missionaries to help them find, but what counted was the help, not the faith. But this doesn't fit the facts. Faith does more than support the missionary. It also transferred to his flock. And this is the effect that matters so immensely, which I can't help but observing. First, then, the observation. We had friends who were missionaries, and as a child, I stayed with them often. I also stayed alone with my little brother in a small rural African village. In the city, we had uh, working for us Africans who had converted and were strong believers. The Christians were always different. Far from having cowed or confined its converts, their faith appeared to have liberated and relaxed them. There was a liveliness, a curiosity, an engagement with the world, a directness in dealing with others that seemed to be missing in traditional African life. They all stood tall. Uh, and then he kind of goes into a little, uh, a little kind of a couple stories about this, um, about that. He says, uh, let's see. When I came back to Malawi, it was, it was the same. I met no missionaries. And you don't encounter missionaries in the lobbies of expensive hotels discussing development strategies as you do with secular charities. Instead, I noticed that a handful of the most impressive African members of this pump aid team were privately strong Christians, privately because the charity is entirely, entirely secular. And I never heard any of its team so much as mention religion while working in the villages but I picked up the Christian references in our conversation. One I saw studying a devotional textbook in the car. One on Sunday went off to church for a two-hour service. Two-hour service. 
<laughs> it would suit me to believe that their honesty, diligence, and optimism in their work was unconnected with personal faith, that their work was secular, but surely affected by what they, by what they were. What they were was, in turn, influenced by a conception of man's place in the universe that Christianity had taught. Um, and he just kind of, if you'd like a copy of this, uh, it's really interesting. And he kind of sums it up uh, this way. Christianity, post-Reformation and post-Luther, with its teaching of a direct personal two-way link between the individual and God, unmediated by the collective and unsubordinate to any human being, smashes straight through the philosophical and spiritual framework uh, that I've described. And he talks about the, uh, the great weight that was grinding down the applicant, if you will. It offers something to hold on to, and that's why and how it liberates. Those who want Africa to walk tall amid 20th century global competition must not kid themselves by providing the material means or even the know-how that accompanies what we call development. A whole belief system must first be supplanted, and I'm afraid it has to be supplanted by another. Removing Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. Isn't that a really interesting perspective? Um, like I said, he goes into a lot more detail, and you can go ahead and take that if you'd like, but... Um, it brings to life Moses' words here. Other nations will see you. And as you follow that word, as you take it to heart, and as you keep it and do it, they notice right, that this is something different. And it's not something that they can just kind of conjure up themselves. It has to come from outside of themselves, has to be given as a gift, right? Which is exactly what Moses is, is talking here about, the divine revelation that, that Israel has received. Kind of also, you know, makes you think of Paul's words to uh, in Second Timothy when he says the Scriptures make you wise for salvation. Um, they can do something to us that just can't be accomplished by any other means. Uh, it struck me when you were when you threw that out that um, he was saying. what mattered, it was still belief to him. And I mean, he, he, there was a line in there to the effect of uh, um, a direct connection between an individual and God without any mm -hmm. mediation. And it's kind of the concept of the church visible and invisible. It's the church invisible that can really add weight. Not the church visible, not the hymns, not, you know, the overtly, oh, I am Well, I don't know if he'd make that division. I, I think part. I think he would say, um, you know, the external is important because you can't have the internal without the external, right? I mean, to, to approach that question as Lutherans, you know, uh, God works through means, right? Whether that's scripture, whether that's baptism or, or supper or even people talking to each other, right? Um, but I think kind of I think part of his point is simply that. In the cultures that he encountered, there was nothing within those cultures that was liberating those people. Even even within the relief efforts that people had, that they thought they were doing good, right? That it had to take something so radically different and from the outside to actually give the dignity to the human person, and kind of with all the good intentions that people had, it wasn't doing that. And so you had this, this transcendent belief um, and transcendent message. Um, yeah. But it is interesting, yeah, that these people are just kind of in, uh, going about their business. Um, and he, 
I, I like that line. I picked up the Christian references. You know, they weren't necessarily preachy about it, but they were reading devotional texts, right? They're going to church. Well, so, yeah. How long have you been saying that? No. Well, <laughs> I, I could do that. Uh, Jerry, you're okay. Right. Yes, yes, exactly, and, and hold on to that thought too, because especially when we get to the end of our section tonight, you know, verses 9 through 14 lays out, okay, uh, here, are the things, here are the things that you kind of do to, to keep these statues. One of them is teaching them to your kids, right? One of them is meditating on them, not just, not just doing them, but meditating on them, right? Um, yeah. 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 The greatness does, and we get those rhetorical questions, right? Uh, take a look at verses seven and eight. And that's the force of those questions. What great nation is there that has a God so near to it as us? The answer being, there is none. <laughs> there is none that has God this close as to, to give us his own word, to make his presence known. Yeah. And you even see this, um, you know, as you uh, look at some of the Old Testament stories, you know, you have Rahab and Jericho, who already heard stories about, that's why she is so hospitable to the spies, right? Because she's already heard um, of what Yahweh had been doing with the people. So even within the, the, the Old Testament story, you get fulfillments of this. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I, I like what you said too at the beginning, Jerry, especially about you know, this is how uh, Israel is set apart, again, not because they're special, but to be that light and that salt, which is the same language that Christ uses of us in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and not for privilege, not for yourselves, but for the sake of the world. Yeah, exactly. Good. Any, any further thoughts? Or I know that was kind of a, hopefully not too much of a detour, but just to say these words you know, certainly apply to us as Christians, right? That, that as we are set apart uh, you know, in baptism, as we are set apart by the word, we also are that witness. Um, so let's continue then with verses 9 to 14. And we'll probably move a little bit more quickly through this part. Um, and we have to because we only have a few minutes left. Right, Carol? So uh, take, uh, listen to uh, verses 9 through 14. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, how on that day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. The Lord said to me, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, so that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire, and you heard the sound of words but saw no form, for it was only voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. That's where we get the sticky number ten. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you are going over to possess. All right, why, why does Moses take the, the Israelites, at least in their minds, back to Horeb? What do you think he's doing with that? Just a reminder. Under the cloud, one way or the other. Oh, like kind of maybe the golden calf kind of yeah. in the background of that, all right? Yeah. That that might be part of it. Okay. There, there may be something a little more than just fear. I think partly what, what's going on here is that he's reminding them in a way, I'm not making this up, <laughs> right? I mean, just to, to be real clear, because you see how he repeats that? This is what the Lord said to me, gather the people, and so I did it, and the Lord told me to teach you this, and that's what I did, right? So as to say, this isn't just Moses up here rambling. This is from the Lord, right? And so this is why you trust this word, not because I'm saying it, but because it, is, it belongs to the Lord. Yeah. Jerry, do you have... Yes, and, and he even evoked that covenant at the beginning of this sermon. There's kind of a, a, a bookend to this first part of Deuteronomy when he said, you know, remember back when you made this covenant? And he's coming back to it again to say, right, this is, you've, God has made you his people in this, and you've already agreed to it, and that agreement is 
bindings because God is, doesn't change, right? Now take a look. I, oh, so, no, sorry, go ahead. Well, if you look at Virginia and Ford, it's like this is the statute in the rules that I'm teaching you to read. And if you go, if you bound further to um, 14, and the Lord commanded me to teach you the statutes and rules that you might do them in the land going forward. I mean, mm -hmm. that's about as clear as it gets. Yeah. Here are the rules, guys. Now do them. Did you get the, the analogy I made at the beginning about a parent <laughs> sending his kid off to, to college, right? He's repeating it over and over so they don't forget. You know, just like you tell your college kids. Make sure you check your, your bank balance. Don't overspend. Right? You go through all the things that will keep them, keep them safe, right? Now, the, here's the... I think I had this on, uh, on your your worksheet, and I'd be curious to see how you would answer this one. How would one fulfill the injunction to keep your soul diligently? I think he kind of actually lays out a few things in this last section here. Follow the Ten Commandments. Okay. You got the, you got the Ten Commandments right there by name. Yep, good. Teach. Who do you teach? Teach your children. You teach yourself. You talk about it. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think this injunction to teach? Why is that? How does that go about kind of keeping your soul when you teach? When, when you teach, you have to really understand what, you're, what it's all about and you're telling someone. So that if there are any questions, you can answer them. You have to know And especially in this context, uh, if it dies out, what else dies out? Faith. And also the promise of a land. Right? And remember, kind of the, the story of Genesis is the, the preservation of the seed, right? The going into the land to possess the land, not just for their sake, but for the sake of the promise, right? So you keep it going. That's how you keep your soul diligent. <laughs> Because this land is going to be the birthplace of the Messiah. So teaching, Ten Commandments. What else does it say? What's that? Assemble, Assemble and... and together. Right, that's when, that's at, at Horeb, right? When he said gather. But there is something to that, right? That... Um, It's, 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 it's the Ten Commandments, right? It's an ethical command. But it is also the gathering and remembering. Remembering what the Lord has done. So, you know, you got the law part of the Ten Commandments. There's also the gospel part of remembering what the Lord has done. It's one of the reasons why every week, what do we do? We gather, we do what? Holy communion, right? Every week. When we when meditate on what God has done, right? And the saving acts of God every week. Right? So there's this uh, kind of this corporate component. Um, there's the ethical component. There's this meditation component. Um, and you don't really get this in this passage. He's going to flesh this out in the, in the next. But it's, it's that corporate element. It's that ethical element, it's that gospel element, which kind of feeds into the other parts, which is don't get caught up in the idolatry around you. Right? Also, don't get caught up in your own success. You know, we've seen that exhortation in Deuteronomy already, right? You're going to be prone to forget me when things are going well, right? Uh, you're going to be prone to forget me when you're and surrounded glorify by yourself. and glorify yourself and and you're going to be prone to forget me when you have all these people around you who are worshiping other gods, right? So how do you walk, keep your soul? Remember. Remember back, right? Uh, and not just a head knowledge of it, 
But as he says, uh, keeping your soul, uh, and not letting them depart from your heart. In Hebrew, thought, the heart is not emotion. The heart is the will. All right? So it's not just a feeling that you get remembering, but it's kind of much more deep-seated than that. Right? It's not just a head knowledge, but it's, it's down rooted down deep in, in, in your being. Yes, Jerry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. They're really annoying that way. But yeah, 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 they're great. They're great. That's very good, yeah. So yeah, so, so good. You know, again, so Moses is not just kind of leaving this sermon to people hanging. This is what you can do. Remember, teach, meditate on what God has done. Right? And let that sink down into your very being. That's who you are. Uh, again, that, that salvation, that gospel doesn't come from within us. It comes from what God gives and what God has done. And so just kind of take that in as much as you possibly can. Yes. <laughs> it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, Carol. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, well, here's what I meant about the Ten Commandments. So here, here's so uh, turn real quick to Exodus 20. Uh, this it's a little easier to see in the Exodus 20 um, account. So here's a little Hebrew. So the the word commandment is the Hebrew word. I hope you can hear me. And I'm going to turn this so hopefully you can. See too. The the Hebrew word for commandment is uh, the bear, the damar. Um, it's kind of pronunciation doesn't matter. But this word doesn't necessarily mean commandment. Literally, it just means word. That's all it means. And it has the kind of elasticity that we have. In English, with word, I mean, we use we use the word word in a lot of different ways. It can refer to a a word on the page. Uh, it can refer to an account of something. Say, what's the word from Grandma? Right. So it's it's more of an account. Um, you know, we can use it in a much more kind of imperative way, right? Um, so it gets translated, the bear gets translated a lot of different ways. One way it can be translated as commandment. Okay? But oftentimes, especially if you read uh, kind of um, Jewish translations of the Old Testament, they won't even necessarily say the Ten Commandments. They'll say the Ten Words. And here's why. Look at uh, Exodus 20. It says, God spoke all these what? Words. Devarim. Okay? 
He spoke all of these words saying. Now, in your English translations, there's a comma after saying, and then you get the quotation. Okay? So in the Jewish reckoning of this, the first word is this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's the first word. The second word is, you shall have no other gods before you. Right? And then you have all these different words, you know, the verses all the way down. The problem is, like in places in our text for tonight, Moses says, there's how many of them? Ten of them. Is there a numbering system there? No. So, what, uh, <laughs> what, what, the, uh, what the Jewish people did is they said, oh, okay, we got to, Moses said there's ten, so we got to make them ten. So, the first word then is, we are uh, brought out of the land of Egypt, that's the first word. The second word then is, you shall have no other gods before me. So, verse three, or I'm sorry, verse four, is taken as commentary. Right? So the commandment is don't have any other gods. And so, for example, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Right? And then you go to verse, uh, let's see, verse 5. Uh, let's see. Seven, there it is, sorry. You go to verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's the second commandment. Third commandment, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, let's see. There's a that has an extended commentary, right? Um, verse twelve is commandment four: honor your father and mother. Verse thirteen is five. Verse fourteen is six. Verse fifteen is seven. Uh, verse sixteen is eight. Uh, and then you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Nine. Uh, da, da, da. And then, let's see, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, and then ten, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his manservant, his maidservant. So there's ten in that ordering, in the Jewish ordering. And Christians came along and said, we don't really think it's appropriate to number the Lord brought us out of Egypt, because the Lord didn't bring us out of Egypt, right? It's the Christian equivalent to that is Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come again. So they said, okay, we're just going to kind of reorder these. And so that's how we get kind of the Lutheran ordering, which is the Catholic ordering. Okay? And so we bumped everything a little bit. Then, at the time of the Reformation, uh, there was a bit of an iconoclast stream that came through, and by iconoclast, you know, these were reformers who looked at like all the statues and the glass, stained glass and the things that the Roman church had. And they said, that's all idolatry. Right? We can't have any of those images. And so what they did is they reordered their commandments. So the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment is what? You shall not make no idols or you shall not make for yourself a carved image. So they took the commentary and made it a commandment. And then all they did was, well, you get to you know what we would say nine and ten, and they just said, oh yeah, they just put it together. Who's right? Good answer. Good answer. Carol said, God is right. right. So as Lutherans, we don't get too terribly fussy. I mean, we, we agree on an order uh, because you know, we want to teach our children, and you can't, it's hard to teach the Ten Commandments and you have a whole bunch of different, you know, ways of numbering it, so we generally just say, here's the numbering that we use, right? Um, but we're just kind of stuck in a bind because Moses says, I gave you Ten Commandments, or I gave you Ten Words. And if you check the meaning, you use Roman numerals. Right, right. Order them. So, that, so that, that's what I was saying, that we're kind of stuck with those ten um, and again, they kind of have a special place within the law, and then all the other, you know, 612 or whatever that number is, 
grow out of that, out of the ten, as a way of essentially safeguarding those ten. So, for instance, like the Sabbath law, um, you know, you shall not remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? Well, they say, well, we got to be really clear about what that means. So that means you can't go more than a Sabbath day walk, right? Um, or, you, you know, you can't do any work. Well, then what's work? Well, work means, you know. And so those other laws are given to kind of safeguard the ten. Because the, the ten are seen as the, the heart of it. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to see what Jesus does, right? When he's encountered by the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, what, is, what does he always go back to? The ten, right? He returns back to the ten. You know, when they ask, what is the law? shall not kill, you shall not murder, right? You shall not steal. He, he goes directly to that. Um, it's just like that in my thing of God the Creator in the beginning was the Word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why I said the, the numbering, I, we don't get terribly bent out of shape about other than it's nice to be able to say third commandment and we all have the same idea of what we mean when we say the third commandment. Um, I, I had this thought um, as I was studying, preparing you know, for this, I was working on this over the summer on vacation. Wonderful way to spend a vacation is to read Deuteronomy for the week um, in front of a lake. It's great. But what really struck me was um, gosh, Moses is a good leader. Because when you look at how he organizes Deuteronomy, you know, we get this first sermon, and we're coming to the, the close of it here, where he, he tells them what God has done for them. And that corresponds in our catechism to what? The creed. Right? And then he's going to tell them, this is what God asks of you. And he's, as we're going to get in the second sermon, there's this big extended section on uh, the Ten Commandments. What does that correspond to? Ten Commandments, right? And then he goes into, in that second sermon also, he goes into instructions about prayer, worship, right? Uh, corresponding to how we talk about the Lord's Prayer, right? And and then he goes into talking about how you conduct yourselves as a, as a people, you know, in terms of uh, the, the cultic life. And there's a lot of similarities to how he talks about how we would talk about, like, baptism and the Lord's Supper. I mean, it's just kind of like, it's a catechism. It's a big, long catechism class. Um, and it's part of, he's doing what he exhorts the people to do. Teach your ch children and your children's children exactly what he's doing. In these sermons, this is this is how you should be. Right? All right. So with that, it is time. We're we're seven minutes over. Only seven. Uh, so we will not meet next week. Um, we'll meet the week after that. So you have two weeks to work on your homework, um, and we'll pick up then with the, the very tail end of this sermon, uh, and uh, in 2023. We'll get through this next sermon. Take notes. We will. Yeah. It's only 19 chapters. So. All right. Uh, so in our prayers tonight, uh, yeah, you know, we got a lot of folks in our congregation who are, have health needs at this time, finding out how some testing going on. Steve Ulrich is recovering from a little procedure he had. He's doing well. Um, we've got Joan Gibson, if many of you remember Joan. She's in the hospital. Um, uh, we've got uh, several surgeries coming up for Diane Yates and uh, Debbie Lutke and Ashley Pollard. So we got 
a lot of folks who, who need uh, care and attention and certainly prayers. So keep them in mind as we, uh, as we pray tonight. And folks online, feel free to, to join in. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. All right. We'll see you guys online next week. Or no, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. Yeah, I do. Well, and I made it with butter.